We've talked about this quite a bit here on the channel that the moon is the perfect place to build a radio observatory. When you're on the far side of the moon, the moon itself blocks all of the Earth's radio transmissions and you have this pristine view to the sky. And my guest today is Ronald Paladin, who works with Lunar Resources, and they were just awarded a phase two NIAC award to develop their far view telescope. And this is a rover that is able to both build solar panels and the antennas for their radio telescope out of the lunar regolith on the surface of the moon. And the original concept was successful, then they shifted into phase two, where they're going to be sort of examining the details of it. And it could very well be by the 2030s, or maybe even 2040s, we might see this actual telescope get built on the far side of the moon. So Ronald and I talk about what it would take to build these rovers that can harvest the materials, extract out the metals that they need and to be able to actually build these structures on the moon out of local material, which is really exciting. So it's a great interview. Let's get into it. It's got to be surreal now to see the level of lunar exploration that's happening in our lifetimes. I mean, you've been in this field for a long time. Does it feel like it's all coming together? Oh, yeah, like tremendously. So I mean, it's just it's been astounding the change in the last few years uh, to go. I mean, even when Artemis was first conceived, um, it was sort of a slow start. And now it's just, it's unbelievable how much things are, are uh, progressing. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to see, and it's, it's becoming sustainable. And so it's one of the things that, that we've always had with, with stuff on the moon is it's here for a while, then gone, and then back again, and then gone. And so now this looks like it's, it's ongoing. And that's part of uh, what has driven um, our interest in Farview is that with this sustained activity and with things that we can bring to it, the, uh, um, the in-situ resource utilization and a number of other things, um, it opens up lots of doors. And that's the whole point of a lot of these NIAC studies is to really open up a, a new door into the future. And so from that standpoint, uh, we're, we're pleased to, to do this. And uh, the science lead for Farview, uh, Jack Burns, who says hello to you, yeah, um, yeah. has well, been doing this for a very long time, and he's very happy to see all this stuff happening. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually, so people, I, you know, I'll, I'll mention this in the introduction, but this, the Farview telescope and sort of in situ resource utilization that we're going to talk about in this interview. Um, this is a phase two NIAC award. And I was able to introduce the, the concept when the original phase one was released. So let's go into sort of like give people sort of an update on on what is the far view instrument. And then what's really exciting is I then get to we get to go into the results of the phase one so we can talk about what you're going to do for phase two. So before we do that, let's just talk about what is the far view telescope. Uh, the far view telescope is a very large uh, low frequency uh, radio telescope. Uh, it operates in the range of five to 40 megahertz. So this is basically um, a domain where it's, it's very difficult to do the observations on the earth. Uh, there's a lot of earth noise, uh, natural and anthropogenic, um, but um, you have to get someplace radio quiet to do that. And it turns out the far side of the room is a very nice radio quiet area. So that we have now a site, so this is the equivalent of, of a, a dark mountaintop for an optical observatory. Um, but then what is it that we do? And so what Farview is, is 100,000 uh, dipole antennas spread out over 200 square kilometers. So in the context of size, that's that's an area larger than Washington, D.C. So this is a very big uh, telescope. Uh, the the, the 100,000 dipoles are built in situ. So we use actually the lunar regolith. Uh, we extract metals from it, and we uh, produce these antennas directly on the surface of the moon. So these are strip antennas. These are basically more like what people were familiar with in the 50s and 60s for TV antennas. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the thickness and shape, I mean, basically you can simulate what these antennas would look like with a strip of, of uh, heavy-duty aluminum foil. They're, they're thicker than that, but they're that's probably the closest human analog 
Oh, look at this. I mean, yeah. in the sorry, in in the field of like radio astronomy now, there actually do seem to be a lot of different ways to approach this problem. Like we're all familiar with the traditional big antenna like Arecibo or the Green Bank Observatory, but we've seen other kinds of telescopes coming together, like what they're putting with the square kilometer array out of Australia, where it's right. like Christmas trees. Yeah. Uh, but you're talking about what would appear more like a ribbon running along the ground. Right. Correct. And, and uh, part of it is ease of construction. Uh, so that, that uh, these antenna uh, are deposited from a, a rover. So it just uh, smooths out the surface a little bit, uh, deposits the aluminum down, uh, attaches electronics, and then moves on to the next one. And, you know, 100,000 dipoles are a lot of dipoles. And 100,000 of anything is, <laughs> it takes you a while. So this is going to take, you know, five or six years to build. Uh, but uh, it's done so robotically. And one of the reasons we opted to go with uh, this type of arrangement is that it's actually an interferometer, and it's a radio interferometer, and so it allows us to do things that you can't do with a single dish. And so that's been the real science push for this, is to get a radio interferometer. And amongst other things, it images the whole sky above the horizon. So we see the whole sky. We don't point. Uh, all the data comes in. So um, besides doing the cosmology, that which is our primary science goal, We'll be able to look at um, radio transients that would pop up. Um, we could look at aurora on Jupiter and understand the sensitivity. 100,000 dipoles gives you a lot of sensitivity. We expect to be sensitive enough to actually detect a cell phone operating on Pluto. So this is a very sensitive telescope. And so one of the problems that we have is to make sure that, that uh, the far side of the moon stays pristine. And so there are, are uh, organizations, uh, international organizations trying to maintain that since this is a, a unique site. Uh, but, you know, the, the option to go with uh, building these, these uh, sets of dipoles, and we're going to build them in subarrays. So it's not going to be one string of connected dipoles. It's a set of somewhere between um, you know, 250 to, to 300 uh, subarrays scattered through this area. Each subarray will have something on the order of four or 500 dipoles. And those are parameters that we're going to derive during uh, phase two. Um, the phase one study was just a feasibility study. You know, is this possible? And the answer was, yes, it is. Uh, so now we actually have to go through and, and develop the numbers and, and do the, and the analyses. But um, exactly how the dipoles will be arranged in the subarrays and how the subarrays are going to be arranged in the observatory are one of the key products of the phase two study is that we'll do a full up science simulation and it will set all kinds of parameters um, to achieve the, the science goals. And then we will also be doing a physical demonstration in a vacuum chamber that we have with lunar simulant uh, to deposit uh, some of our our um, our strips to see if, how how reality actually is versus you know the theoretical, and we have two deposition technologies that we're looking at, both developed by Lunar Resources, and we'll uh, deposit those um, uh, in the vacuum chamber, see if they meet expectations, compare the two, see what amount of energy is needed to produce them, and then down select one of those two uh, technologies. Uh, as our, our initial baseline. And then um, we take all that stuff, the science results, the uh, demonstration results, and then integrate that into a comprehensive end-to-end -end, uh, numerical model to say, all right, this is how we're gonna build it. And this is gonna be the, these are the, we're gonna find at least two, preferably three suitable locations on the moon. And we've already done a little bit of that. And it, that's a lot harder than just looking for a flat surface. Um, nothing is flat on the moon to begin with, so there's a little bit more effort there. Uh, but we're also looking at anomalies, magnetic anomalies, other things. Uh, we have to land an area that has enough aluminum content for us to get um, all the metals that we need out of it. So all of the aspects of Farview are a massive system of systems. And so my job is actually to keep track of all the, the various stuff and <laughs> make sure at the end that all of this stuff actually closes and that we actually have a system concept uh, that meets the science requirements, can be delivered to the moon, uh, can live long enough to be scientifically productive. Because the one big advantage of 
in situ resource utilization is if something breaks, we just go fix it. So if we build a, a subarray and we turn it on and we find out there's a break somewhere in you know power line or something, we just go back to that point and, and lay down a patch and we're ready to go again. And so it has a major advantage over anything that requires you to deliver everything to the moon. Because if something breaks, then, then I got to have a new launch. Now I just notify a robot that, hey, we have a problem here, go fix it. Uh, so a very different way of building things. And this is part of what we want to do with Farview is to show that for the moon with a sustainable ISRU presence, that you can approach how you would build things, how you would manage things, how would you do performance for science or engineering or human habitat in a different way. Uh, it's been talked about for decades. But we're proposing that, that we can actually show that this can be, be done in a relatively simple and affordable way. I mean, you know, this is still a big observatory. It's not going to be cheap to build, but it's not going to be something comparable with uh, James Webb. It's going to be something a lot smaller than that. So, so I, I want to, I mean, you, you, you th- quite nicely went through every part of the questions that I want to ask. Um, so unfortunately, I think we're going to need to retread some some terrain here because uh, you sort of handled it all, but at a higher level, and I want to dig into some details. So, so, you know, I want to understand the physical system here. You're standing on the moon, you're watching the rover go by. What is it? Okay, so what are, what we have is uh, let me let me give you actually a more step by step of each of the sections, and then we can come back and talk. Sure, about yeah, it. yeah, like from launch to right. launch to maintenance. Right, and so you know the first thing we do is we got to package the stuff that we need uh, into a rocket and launch it, land it, and then deploy it. So um, that's part of the study. We're going to come up with a list of all the pieces of hardware we need, but that's not something that that um, we need to go into here. Um, but we land, and the first thing we're going to do is deploy our extraction and manufacturing hardware. And there's two key components of that. Um, the um, um, uh, the ex- actual extraction, if I can speak, the extraction hardware uh, is uh, something that we've been developing for, for years. And it uses electrolysis to pull, to break apart the oxides in the moon and get uh, various metals and oxygen out. And so um, it requires a fair amount of power. So we would set it up in an area where uh, it's uh, enough aluminum abundance. That's our main interest in this particular uh, demonstration. Um, And so we'll set that up, power it up, um, do checkout. So that's sort of the first day is that we'll just be setting up the hardware. In parallel, uh, one of the other things that we will need on the moon is power. And so we have a system uh, that we've developed to manufacture solar rays on the lunar surface. Yeah. And so that will be also set up. And while these are not the high efficiency solar rays that you will find on spacecraft, we don't need them to be high, high, high efficiency. We have a lot of lunar area to cover. I can cover a square kilometer with solar rays if I need it. Uh, right. So efficiency isn't the, the issue. Survivability, ease of manufacture, there are lots of other things that come into it. So for the first day, we just basically set up. Um, and at the same time, uh, right now we're uh, partnering with Lockheed Martin to look at their um, Lockheed Mobility Vehicle. It's a, an amazing uh, lunar rover um, as our, our baseline rover. Uh, and so it would uh, go out and start checking out possible build sites because right now we don't have enough um, information on the sites to really get down to, to the meter level that we need. But uh, eventually that may may Occur, but even so, we'd want people, we'd want the robots to check out and image the sites to make sure there's nothing, no surprises or anything. So, um, and then at night we shut down. So the first night we just all hibernate, and then uh, at dawn the next day we start up everything else. Right, fourteen Earth days, like these. Yeah, the day, 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 day night of the moon is long. Day. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, what right now looks like is the scenario is we will operate for two or three lunar days where we would just be pulling out uh, metals from the uh, uh, regolith, stockpiling them, uh, setting up solar rays, building them, storing those. And then probably day three or four, 
we would then load up rovers uh, with um, the store, with the, the extractor aluminum. And on each rover is a deposition package that um, we don't know which of the two options we have. We have a um, space uh, deposition manufacturing hardware that uh, I think you talked with, with Alex about um, that is derived from uh, flights on Wake Shield uh, in the 90s. And it basically vaporizes aluminum and can deposit it directly on, on, on the surface. We have a new technology that we're that uh, we're developing that is an additive manufacturing uh, technology that uses a different process. Um, it, it pulses electro, uh, electrical energy and it can get some pretty intense uh, megawatt pulses uh, and manufacturing. So the study that we're going to do is which of these two do we go with? And, and if so, I was to pick this up, like if I was to like fall behind the rover and pick this up with my bare hands, ignoring the horrible pain of being in vacuum, what would this these two versions kind of feel like uh the first version the space deposition uh manufacturing would feel like you just picked up a piece of aluminum foil okay so it'd be uh 10 meters long a few centimeters wide uh and about as thick as you know maybe four or five uh strips of heavy duty aluminum foil so it's still pretty thin mm -hmm. um the uh we're looking right now as to uh the other technology the pe3d the pulse uh, electrical uh 3d printing uh, it's probably going to be more wire-like, but that's part of what this, this, the, it's, it's currently in a separate development. And so we're waiting for them to, um, um get us information on, on what would be the right kind of, of uh, dipole. So like and, more surface area for material, which might yeah. work really well right. for a radio telescope. Right. And so, yeah. and that's, that, and you hit on one of the key points is that, um, the more, aluminum we need the more difficult this becomes so if we can come up with ways to reduce the amount of aluminum content um and you know that is not just the manufacturing process that's what do we need to actually get the signal um variety of things we have a couple of missions that are going to uh, land on the moon with low frequency radio telescopes in the next couple of years uh, those will answer a lot of the in situ issues because nobody's done this on the moon before these will actually do it and so that will give us real engineering and scientific data. And we may have to modify our dipole antennas, make them thicker, thinner, uh, whatever the issue is. But once that, that data is in, which hopefully will be before uh, the study ends, uh, we can then adapt. Because that, I think, is one of the other aspects of this that is lost on a lot of people, is this is a highly adaptable approach. So if in the process of building the first subarrays for Farview, uh, we find that you know something is not going right. The the uh, um, regolith is too coarse or something. We need to make the the dipoles thicker. Um, fine, we just uh, adjust the commands on the, uh, on the deposition system and make them thicker. Um, it's a very different way to look at doing space missions. I've mm -hmm. worked in space. I've worked in space since the late late 70s. And the problem is once it's up there, you can't do anything about it. Well, no, this is not the case here. I can change it whenever I want. Uh, if we find that, you know, 10 meter dipoles are too short, we'll make them 15 meters. Uh, it, it impacts our design and we have to may have to stop for, for a few days to figure out exactly what we want to do. But it's like building it on the earth is mm -hmm. that all of our resources are there and we can adapt uh, to uh, do what is necessary to get the science. Yeah, I, I think of an analogy, like I'm doing a lot of trail building right now on my mm -hmm. property. And sometimes the ground is smooth, the dirt is easy, the plants are spread apart and the trail almost builds itself. And then other times you've got to go up a hill and there's a root system that's right in the way of exactly where you want to go and your progress slows down, but it never stops. Right. And the one other advantage that, that Farview has over dish antennas and everything else is once the first, let's say, 400 dipole subarray is built and we attach it, uh, solar arrays and, and power it up, it's gathering science. So after the, you know, basically by probably day three or four, we will have at least one, probably more uh, operating subarrays. So the science will start coming in 
uh, within six months, uh, certainly after we land. Uh, so very different than spending five years hoping it's all going to work and then turning it on and find out there's an issue. Um, so once we get that first data in, we'll probably pause, do a detailed analysis of what we got. Are we actually seeing what we expect to see? And are there changes that we want to make? And then go we'll build the rest of them. Uh, so it's, it's a very um, evolvable, addressable uh, science mission where um, even if, you know, 10 years from now, somebody says there's a new something or other that we want to look at and we need this kind of performance, we can adapt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it, it just is, is a, a fundamentally different way of looking at science missions in the sense that we're building. It, it's, it's really a full analogous, analogous to doing it on the ground. And I wonder, though, like even as you're building it and you're starting to get those science results, you can put in enough sort of experiments within the lay, the way you're laying out the thickness, the distance between the dipoles. And then you go, oh, we're getting better performance from this configuration than that configuration. So let's build the rest of the telescope or this next thing. So it's almost like you're evolving it on the fly. Absolutely. And, yeah. and one of the things that I've thought of doing is since we'll have um, time in the early days is even set up a very small uh, test array uh, to look at things so that we don't have to, to wait. I mean, you know, again, um, we will have tested all the hardware and else before we launch it, but things don't always operate as they should uh, uh, in theory. And so once we're, we've are we got a pile of aluminum and once we have the rovers uh, set up, uh, we could easily run some test strips um, and look at them. We don't need astronauts to do this. Uh, we're one of the other aspects of this is because of the Earth noise, we're not going to be able to do this near the South Pole. Uh, hmm. The Earth noise diffracts around the limb of the moon. And so we've got to be, you know, 20, 25 degrees away from the limb of the moon uh, for our sites. So the likelihood of having um, Artemis astronauts there um, early on is, is pretty small. But, you know, NASA is now starting to look at, at what they're going to do elsewhere on the moon rather than just at the poles. Uh, and so it, certainly we could uh, benefit from some astronaut looking at the stuff and saying, yeah, that looks right or no, it doesn't. But we also have remote sensing and cameras and stuff that we should be able to do that. So there's, so, there's a lot of adaptability. So what are the limits? I mean, if you're building your solar panels out of the material on the regolith, you're building your dipoles out of the material on the on the regolith, there is, there's got to be some finite amount of component that you're bringing with you, right? When does this, oh, yes. yeah. when does this run out? Okay, the, the issue, and in fact, the biggest factor for us, and one of the things we'll spend a lot of time in phase two at, is the electronics. Uh, as of right now, we can't build the electronics on the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, we think with our additive manufacturing process, there might be a path to building simple electronics. Um, that'll be something that's probably beyond the scope of this. But at some point, we would like to see if this could build um, simple circuits. Uh, and one of the things we're going to look at uh, is for electronics, in particular, the um, uh, preamplifiers for the antennas. Um, preamplifiers are easy to build on Earth. Um, and they're simple, they're relatively lightweight. But when you're building 100,000 of them, 100,000 100, of even something that doesn't weigh much is a lot. Yeah. And so what we're, one of the things we will look at is that's our, our sort of key limiting factor is that um, all of these things need to be electronically powered. They need to have a um, preamplifier that can survive lunar night and lunar day, uh, the radiation environment, all that kind of stuff. And so that's the one thing that we can't build. Uh, now, we may be able to do it by 2030s, which is when we would do this. But, um, you know, as of right now, we're, we're going to look at uh, what are our options. And one of the things, and we're going to be working with our, our partner, Lockheed Martin, on this, is if we can come up with some way to really extremely lightweight uh, the electronics so that we're down into ounces rather than, than uh, uh, kilograms. Like what is a pre-amplifier uh, weigh, like for your needs? Uh, you know, right now, um, half a kilogram, something like that. Hmm. So, right. you know, and, so that, that'll you know, add up quickly when you're doing a yeah. hundred thousand so, of them. Yeah, and, but you know, there's, there's not been any attempt to 
lightweight them or mm-hmm. streamline or anything else. So there's no need. So why would I bother doing this? Well, now there's a need. And so one of the things that we think we'll be able to do is, um, except for the circuitry, we probably would be able to build the rest of it, a box, shielding, all that kind of stuff, out of regular. Uh, and so what we're looking at is a hybrid system where we would take some small subset of component um, and can build a box to put it in and do those. So our solar array uh, system would also be generating preamp boxes. Uh, and then we would just integrate the two together mm-hmm. and... Uh, off we go. The other advantage of that is if there then is a failure, because the, the preamp failures are probably going to be our, our limiting factor. The, the dipoles will last for a very long time. Um, again, it becomes real easy to replace them. I don't have this, to launch them from Earth. This is how you get von Neumann probes. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> keep this process going, and eventually, you know, we're we're sending out spacecraft to every star system in the in the observable universe. Right. Yeah. And, you know, this ability to to um, take advantage of your surroundings and use those for your tools. But, you know, that that just is such a different way, uh, you know, and it allows us to experiment so we can actually say, let's try this and see if this works. And then, nope, that didn't work. So let's Wouldn't try this. Other- think like we will be able to build pretty much anything that we would need for these kinds of tasks, telescopes, electronics, purely in situ. Like, do you think that's, are we, is that hundreds of years? Is that a generation? I I think that given what we're working on at Lunar Resources and what other groups are working on, by the 2030s or 2040s, I think we'll be able to do things. And I think, again, what you want to look at is a different set of requirements than what I'm doing on Earth. Um, you know, here on Earth, um, I want, you know, very compact, high efficiency, all that kind of stuff. On the moon, I may not need that. And so I may be able to get by with much simpler circuits. Um, the other aspect that if I can go with a very large scale, simple circuit to do the job that now is relatively uh, invulnerable to uh, radiation effects and, and other things, that's a better solution for me than some super duper high tech circuit that's going to get hit by a cosmic ray and get fried. Uh, so it's a different set of requirements. And in looking at how we're going to build Farview, that's one of the big factors that comes in that I, I remind people all the time. We're not doing this on the earth. We're doing this on the moon. So we have a high vacuum, uh, so I can do things in that high vacuum that I can't do uh, if I'm sitting in, in a laboratory. Uh, we have radiation effects and stuff. And so optimizing it for some particular parameter that is desirable for an Earth-based uh, application may not be the way I want to go for mm-hmm. a lunar-based. I mean, we have so- those things, like like here on Earth, you've got weather, rain, wind, uh, all of these just the existence of the atmosphere. I mean, one of the one of the most exciting technologies that I've been watching is is perovskite solar panels, and you could paint the side of a building and turn it right. into a solar panel. The downside is the moment it it encounters ox- the the air, the atmosphere, it starts to degrade. Right. And so these kinds of of technologies. So, do you think? like materials engineers have really wrapped their minds around what it means to build things in low gravity, no atmosphere, all of this kind of stuff in space? I don't think so. Um, much of my career has been spent looking at, at uh, space missions and, and architectures and such of uh, such missions. And we always run into the problem of um, past history. This is how we've always done it. Well, okay, that times have changed you know things have changed uh and getting someone to change how they have spent the last 20 years designing things to a completely different approach is not not easy um there's just so many um implied needs that aren't there anymore i mean you you went through the list for for the earth i mean the, the moon is the same thing except it's a different set i now have no atmosphere i have a vacuum 
I have cosmic rays. I have charging from solar events. I have I pass through the Earth's geotail. Uh, micrometeorites. Every month. Yeah, micrometeorites. So, so it's the same. There's there's an equivalent list of things I need to be concerned about. It's just a completely different list than the one I'm dealing with. And so, part of what we're doing in the phase two study is to really look at that from a manufacturing standpoint rather than just uh, uh, you know a science standpoint is that that uh, we're going to build solar arrays on the moon okay so what happens when dust gets into our silica what happens when uh, we get a charging event during uh, manufacturing of a, of a solar array so those are things that we're going to have to work on none of them are the sort of thing that is is intractable or or uh, we don't know how to do that we don't most but we don't know how to do it because we never bothered thinking about it and so you know in going through all this stuff uh, it will be you know what do we need to do to adapt our laboratory system um, to operate in a lunar environment and that's part of the reason we're doing our our deposition demonstration in our uh, dirty vacuum chamber is that we want to have dust in there i mean it's gravity i can't get rid of gravity so uh, but i can uh, do the thermal cycling i can do all the other sorts of things uh, that i need to do so i can eliminate some of the problems now we talked about the rover passing you on the on the first day let's say we're now six months in and big chunks of the network are complete i'm standing out there in the middle of the telescope looking across the horizon what am i seeing <laughs> sadly you're seeing uh, a barren lunar surface. You're 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 standing up, looking at over 200 square kilometers, uh, looking for strips of aluminum that are a few centimeters across and 10 meters long. Uh, you might get an occasional glint from the sun, but uh, this is not going to be that impressive to look at. You'll see uh, the solar array setups for each subarray, uh, and then um, most of the antennas are just going to be lying on the ground. Mm. Uh, so once you get close to them, yeah, then you'll see the strips and, and stuff. In fact, one of the things that, that we're looking at is um, eventually astronauts or other or a rover will go through. How do we flag? Don't step here. Uh, <laughs> right. So, so there's just the, the little bit of reality of, of uh, if I'm driving, if I'm, I'm autonomously driving my uh, rover, it's got to see the dipoles so that it doesn't run over them. Uh, and so, you know, there are simple brute force things. We just put up um, basically reflectors that say, you know, here's here's the road. Don't go off the road. Right. Uh, but uh, that's that's going to be sort of a fun part of brainstorming is that, you know, how do I signal that, that uh, you know, you should watch where you're driving. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's unlike a, a giant radio telescope. Um, this is low profile. Um, you know, it'll be probably more visible from lunar orbit because you'll see all the stuff suddenly pop up. You'll see a pattern occur where the rest is, is, uh, uh, chaotic, but, um, and then, uh, you know, it's, it's, as each one is built and the sub arrays, well, they're probably 400 meters on a side, something like that. So, um, that is a benefit because, um, anything bigger than that, you start running into, uh, surface irregularities that are going to cause problems. Uh, and so by keeping them compact, uh, it really makes it easy. We find a nice spot. We may have to, to smooth the surface a little bit if we have to. Um, but it's like your comment about the paths. In some areas, oh, this is fine. We can operate as is. Other area, we're going to need to move some rocks around or do something to, to uh, make everything fit. But, um, you know, the, they're relatively compact. Um, they will have a central power source of some of some kind. Um, we'll be operating at night, so there'll be a nighttime battery of some kind. Unfortunately, uh, lots of organizations, uh, NASA, uh, other space or, uh, space agencies, uh, aerospace companies are all working on nighttime power since that's a problem for everybody. Um, but we have communicate, so there'll be some sort of communication antenna to, to move the data from, from uh, uh, each subarray to some sort of central site where we would then transmit it back to the Earth. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of system level stuff, but it, it's not going to be visually impressive. Um, you'll see a bunch of stuff scattered around. Uh, probably, like I said, be much more impressive from above. 
um, when it is standing on the surface. Right. So, so instead of me sort of standing, looking at the sweeping sort of microchip of radio telescope strewn in front of me, it's more like I'm very carefully walking along the lunar regolith, making sure that I hop over these dipoles yes. and not uh, right. and not tear them up. Um, now, so we've talked about sort of the physical structure. So let's talk about the science. What what do we get with a telescope that is in this wavelength and at this scale? Our primary science goal is to look at the 21 centimeter rate radiation from the uh, dark ages of the universe. So this is the, the era after the Big Bang, before any stars form. The structures are starting to form. The hydrogen's there, but uh, something like Webb can't see it because it doesn't emit light. It emits radio waves. And so we will be looking at the overall distribution of this 21 centimeter signal. Uh, and that will then uh, tell us um, about how the first structures form, what's forming, where um, we get a bunch of stuff on um, possible uh, dark energy, uh, dark matter, uh, neutrinos. There's a whole bunch of, of science information that comes out of that first few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. Uh, and the universe is, is uh, giving us that information. We just can't see it from the Earth. And so from, from the far side of the moon with far view, we will be able to see that. And we see the whole sky. So we will also be able to uh, look for any kind of low-frequency radio emission um, that occurs um, in the visible universe. And so um, we'll be able to look at solar uh, uh, coronal mass ejections, and we'll be able to track those and get information on it better than anything uh, that currently exists. And so we'll be able to, for example, warn the Earth of, of impending uh, CME impacts and, and the such. Uh, any magnetic activity in the solar system we'll be able to see, so we can monitor uh, Aurora on Jupiter or Saturn or, or wherever it exists in, in the solar system. Uh, and like I said, our sensitivity is such that, that um, you know, this uh, domain is dominated by a few objects. Jupiter is very bright in this low frequency range, but we should be able to see things um, around the universe because we do image the whole sky. So we have a huge amount of data. Uh, we don't know how many terabytes of data, but we're going to have a lot of terabytes of data coming in. So radio transients are there. Uh, also, I don't know if you saw the results about uh, YC SETI and uh, the uh, periodic uh, activity that they think is coming from a, a magnetic field around uh, a planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, I actually and, interviewed uh, someone just a couple of days ago on on that. So, yeah. I mean, that had been theorized. So this, like your, t you know, the, the far view is the perfect instrument to detect these m transmissions of magnetospheres from extrasolar planets. Right. Yeah, and yeah. we're uh, much lower frequency. We're not in the gigahertz. We're in the megahertz band. Um, but we should be able to see that same kind of modulation for uh, exoplanets, maybe out to 20 parsecs, something like that. We don't know how far. Uh, this is one of the things that we will be able to see uh, things. And habitability is generally thought to be associated with having a magnetic field that protects you from, from all the particles. So we may be able to identify uh, potentially habitable worlds by just looking for the modulation. <laughs> That's amazing. I th that concept still just baffles me every time that that you get a signal that, that you found an aurora happening. And as a special bonus, you now know there's a planet there like right. that is protected by a magnetosphere. Which right. we really believe is important for for the evolution of life here on Earth. We yeah. we definitely would have a bad day if our magnetosphere went away. Right, and one of the trends you see in astronomy now is we're going to all sky systems. I mean, the X-ray community did that a long time ago, but uh, we've always just pointed at the object of interest. And what we've done is we've missed a lot of objects that are interesting because uh, we just have not to be looking at them at the time they got interesting. And one of the big advantages of the interferometer and of, of uh, Farview is, you know, over the one month lunar cycle, we will image the whole sky. Uh, and so from that standpoint, uh, my, my feeling and one of my major interests, I've always been. Uh, I'm an astronomer by training and always been interested in time variable phenomena. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I'm still alive and, and doing science uh, when this is built, I really want to look at the time variability uh, objects that are in there. So what they're telling us about things. 
And uh, we, because, we look at the sorry, we look at say Vera Rubin. You've got that coming yes. in the in the visible spectrum that you've got yeah. this ability to do this time domain astronomy. You're looking at the sky night after night after night. Is it more? Is it sliced like that, or is it more continuous with far? It's view? more continuous. Uh, mm. So you know, basically, we don't know what our exposure times are going to be. Um, the quote that I said of getting down to uh, detecting a cell phone on Pluto is like a, a couple minute integration. Um, we're going to be bounded by our data flow and a bunch of other processes as to how long, what's the shortest integration time we can do. But certainly minutes are probably reasonable. So we'll get an image of the sky every few minutes. Uh, and that will, I mean, the sky will change. So as the moon rotates, uh, you know, it will sweep out uh, a different part of the sky. Uh, but uh, for the most part, um, you know, we'll be getting a continuous stream of uh, sky images um, from the time we turn on. So, you know, a lot of data, uh, how we're going to handle the data, process the data are certainly one of the big issues that we're going to look at in phase two. Um, but, uh, yeah, it will it will give us a view of the radio sky that we have just not had before. Yeah, there's nothing um, like, I mean... I mean, there are people who have these all sky cameras set up at their observatory to tell them when there's clouds and they're like watching the sky all night. But to get a high resolution image of a large portion of the sky, there are not a lot of instruments that are doing that. Vera Rubin is the is the example. So to suddenly be seeing the entire sky every couple of minutes in this wavelength feels dramatically different, especially because radio waves you know, you can have these events, these transient events happening, popping off, fast radio bursts, things like that. It's kind of stunning. How, you know, this is, you now we're going to, I want to shift a bit outside the scope of of the NIAC, of this specific telescope, and sort of talk about what the future might, might hold. Um, like, where does this go? I mean, if you've got the ability to build solar panels on the surface of the moon, you have the ability to uh, grab lunar regolith, chop it up, separate out the elements, and deposit material in in an intentional way, limited by some of the more complex electronics. Your, I mean, with Farview, it's the simplest possible telescope that you can build. Can you build a more complex telescope? What does that get us? Yeah, well, you, I think you can, but also I think you also need to look past just the telescope uh, we're one of the things that we're we have a proposal in that we're hoping will be selected is to supply a massive power grid for the moon so that basically um two things you're going to need on the moon is power and oxygen uh our processes can do both and so um we would envision a global lunar network where um Basically, you plug in your electronics into some outlet and, and electricity is there. Um, and then similarly for oxygen, uh, the, you know, these um, extraction hardware are not um, overly massive or complex or anything. And so we should be able to, you know, set up your little oxygen generator uh, if you're in some new site uh, and within a few hours start having oxygen being generated and so there's a there's a global sustainable infrastructure that we're trying to support but then getting back to the science yeah there's there's you know i will give you a uh, set of hardware that will extract metals for you and then allow you to manufacture it into something that's modestly complex I and mean, a solar cell is not a simple thing to do. I mean, this has got some level of complexity. And so um, with that capability, can I design other science instruments to do things? And for example, one of the things with this simple radio telescope is we also will do lunar soundings because we will be able to uh, look for, for uh, subsurface soundings from, from the radio signals. So I can set up a network of, of uh, sounding stations around the moon and, and understand the structure better and, and do things. Um, one of the things that, that we could also do with this is an aid for astronauts since we can indeed probe below the surface. Uh, looking for voids or, mm. or caves or other things. So there's a safety aspect of this where, um, you know, we could explore um, what's beneath the surface so that some astronaut doesn't fall through some some 
thin layer on the surface into a into a volcanic uh, tube or something. So there's some general uses there, but yeah, the, it's unlimited. I mean, you know, the, where are we going to go with this? I mean, wherever you want. Well, uh, I, I guess I think about like with say the square kilometer array, there they have these Christmas tree like antennas that are very different from what you're proposing. Right. So but it's a more complex, more sensitive instrument that's perceiving at different wavelengths. But still on the moon, you're you really want to be protected from the radio transmissions that are coming from from Earth. So so do you see this approach scaling up to something that is a more elaborate structure than aluminum foil? laid out on the yeah. moon. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we are actually have other other areas that we're looking at to build structural elements and that sort of thing out of the regolith. And so, you know, I have, you know, aluminum pellets or aluminum uh, wire, however we want to extract it. I will look and also have that with silicon iron. Uh, so I have a whole host of um, minerals in the lunar surface, um, all these metals that I can extract. Um, fortunately, all, with all the oxides there, I also get a oxygen as a bonus but i now have piles of um pure metals and our laboratory tests are things are 99 uh, percent pure 98 percent pure or something like that and this is preliminary we're we're looking at getting uh, truly pure and so i could easily envision once this is proven and accepted as manufacturing alloys on the moon i mean you know that you need some mix of something or other um you have piles of the raw elements, blend them however you want, put it into some kind of furnace or whatever that you need, um, extrude out I-beams if you want and build something. Uh, so yeah, the, again, it's it's an ability to expand our horizons, uh, to uh, you know uh, extract all these metals uh, and use them for something useful rather than shipping them from the earth. Yeah, I mean, and when you look at say the escape velocity of the moon, it is one sixth what it is on Earth. And the amount of energy it's going to take you to get stuff off of the moon out into space is dramatically lower. Things like space ele elevators, rail guns start to make mass drivers start to make sense in mm -hmm. that kind of an, an environment. Where do you think the like, what role do you think the moon plays in the future of humanity's exploration of the solar system? Well, I think as a, as a resource, I mean, you know, the, the basically the current uh, uh, efforts are this is a, a test area where we're going to figure out how to do things. But there's a lot of easy to access resources. Uh, everybody needs oxygen. So I can have the moon be an oxygen station. And if you're going to head off to Mars, uh, you stop in lunar orbit with your, your vehicle and fill up on uh, your tanks on oxygen and stuff and before you head off. And similarly, um, it's probably going to be easier, I've done the calculations, but it's probably going to be easier to ship iron and other metals from the moon uh, than it is from the earth. Mm -hmm. And so extract it, you know, send them off to wherever you're building. Uh, for Mars, it's probably less of a problem since Mars has its own uh, dirt that you can extract. But if I want to build an iron structure on Ganymede, it's not a lot of iron in that ice. Uh, and so if I could send uh, minerals, I mean, this is, in a sense, something similar to the asteroid mining that has been talked about for a long time. Um, but this is now using resources on, on the moon to easily get them to a remote site uh, for building, uh, where at that site, there simply isn't the resources necessary. Do, do you and think that that it'll be lunar resource extracting i mean you know i know the name of your company um but compared to asteroids like what do you think in the end you know science fiction tells us you've got you know the belters uh, zipping from asteroid to asteroid extracting the resources um how do you think it will play out in the in the long term you know i, mean, I think that's that's going to be one of the real tests of the technology is that um the technology that we're um using to extract the stuff from the moon uh, is based on a couple of things. If there is a little bit of gravity, which helps, um, they're not going to have that with the with the asteroids. Um, both have good vacuums and stuff. The moon is pretty rich in metal oxides. Um, 
I don't know what the what the mineral complex is on um, asteroids and how easy it is to extract the metals efficiently and ship them off. Uh, we have got a lot. We have a lot of real estate, um, and so it's not going to be that difficult uh, to do things. Um, you know, even for Farview, the volume that we need to build this giant uh, two hundred kilometer square array is. Um, tens of tons but it's not millions of tons mm-hmm. uh and so we actually don't need uh, much more than a few hundred uh, uh square uh meters of surface to get all the aluminum that we need and so it's it's really going to be a trade between energy uh resources because the one problem that you have is we can use solar energy i mean we could in principle do all this with solar cells um if i'm out at five or six AUs, solar cells aren't going to be the most efficient thing to do. Um, I've got to figure in the cost of my materials by transporting my energy source. Now, there are some really innovative stuff out there for new energy sources and stuff, so that, that may solve it. But I think the trade analysis is going to be, you know, here's what we're doing on the moon. Is the asteroid approach more or less efficient? Um, and that will dictate it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, if I'm getting out to Neptune, you know, it may be better to, to pick something that's closer to Neptune than the moon. Uh, but if I'm uh, in the inner solar system, I probably think the moon's going to probably be the, the easier and more uh, cost efficient uh, approach. Um, and then, like, just, you know, this idea that I mentioned earlier on about this idea of, of von Neumann probes, um, you know, one of the really weird mysteries of just our existence here on earth is that we look out of the universe and we don't see any evidence of of aliens and people say well you know it's they're really far and i'm like well it's not about how far they are it's like why haven't they built spacecraft to explore every nook and cranny of the of the milky way because it feels like we are racing towards that capability that within i guess now decades we will have the ability to send out our first von Neumann probes, our self-replicating robot probe. So, so when do you think, and what are the like the major stumbling blocks that will stop us from being able to create von Neumann probes? The the self-replicating robot probes that that head out and build more copies of themselves as they spread out into the universe. Well, I think you know the the as you said, this is becoming a major conundrum. We now know that there are lots of planets. Uh, there are lots of planets in habitable zones. Where is everybody? Um, and so <laughs> the depressing part of this is um, maybe the factors is one of the, uh, the factors that goes into this is how long does the techn- technological civilization live? Uh, and as we're destroying our Earth and everything else, I could easily see that some natural catastrophe would, would uh, start uh, making this a little more difficult to do. I hope that doesn't happen. Yeah, but, no, let's just, let's just think positive thoughts here. Yes. Um, you know, that it's hard to say. I mean, you know, that, that um, interest in doing that, I think is one of the keys. And this is one of the things that, that it's been nice to see with, with the Artemis program and, and stuff. It's regenerating interest in doing things in space. I mean, you know, that there's lots of, now pop-up articles about something that James Webb has seen or something that Hubble has seen. And so there's there's a, an absence of interest in space for maybe the you know the 1990s and 2000s, but not a lot was happening. And now with some of the spectacular new results from Webb, um, the Artemis program, I mean, even um, the uh, Starship uh, explosion yesterday, you know, going into space is hard and this is a pretty good start. Uh, and so people are looking for the next launch and saying, you know, yes, we want to do this. And I think that's the thing I would like to try and do with something like Farview and some of the other things that we're doing is maintain that interest is that space is part of humanity and what we really need to move out there. There's a lot to discover. There's a lot to, to understand, um, you know, most of the universe, dark energy, dark matter. We don't know what it is. I mean, are you really content to know that that you under, understand less than five percent of your surroundings? That's, that doesn't give me a good, comfortable feeling. And so, understanding how we do things out there, um, there may be options to uh, utilize lunar 
uh, materials for Earth application. It may be easier to, I mean, since aluminum is so easy to get on the moon, maybe it's better to get aluminum from the moon rather than from, from bauxite. Uh, so, you know, those are all things that will have to play out. But it's it's that ability to develop a space economy. And the space economy is quite large, much larger than most people realize. I mean, it's mostly right now in terms of communications and imagery and such, but it's growing in other sectors too. And so with a robust space economy, we also then become a little more resilient to uh, problems on the earth. Uh, so I think it really is trying to establish a robust and productive space economy before we start getting overwhelmed by a lot of the daily uh, human aspects of this and our ability to work together and to, to look at this. And again, another nice thing about Artemis is that the whole world's involved. Um, this is really nice. Yeah. Yeah. It, like I've been doing this job for 25 years and it feels like everything is different now that, that the, the kinds of technologies that are being developed and deployed seem very practical to me in ways that they seem like science fiction 20 years ago. And the enthusiasm across multiple fronts, but not just NASA, not just the private industry like SpaceX, but also the European Space Agency, United Arab Emirates, China, India, like there is a global excitement in having humanity become a spacefaring civilization. And what I think as, as science fiction has filled our he heads with a lot of nonsense, and I think as we spread out into the, into the solar system, we will appreciate how wonderful Earth is more and more every day. And I think that I'll, I'll hopefully a lot of our energy will, will be about protecting Earth for what it does that's special. And I think, yeah, you set up your bauxite mines on, on the moon, and then you don't have to chew up more rainforest. Right. And I think, you know, and I've been doing this uh, a good bit longer than your 25 years. Yeah. And I would agree with you. I think that yeah. the, the environment is just really different. I mean, I will admit uh, being skeptical when Artemis was pr proposed because I've seen this come and go. Um, and something's changed yeah. because this is now something that I'm willing to bet on in the future. Uh, this is not something that the next administration will will change course or whatever. This is self replicating. I mean, you know, and with industry getting involved in it, um, small businesses like us, but also large uh, businesses, it's going to be hard for it to go away. Uh, a lot of the things that I have seen uh, various groups posting about uh, space hotels or mining asteroids or any of this sort of sort of stuff are now ringing a little more true than they were. <laughs> 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's, we, I see, I was been a technologist long, almost as long as I've been a, a scientist. I see the technology really coming to fruition. Um, and that what people are proposing while it is outlandish in, in some level, it's doable. It's, yeah. I can see a path to get there. Yeah. I 100% um, agree with you. And, yeah. and that's been a big change. And I think, Hopefully that will help stimulate a lot of people to look for new ways to do things. We have lots of problems operating in space, but they're things that we can solve. And yeah. it's really getting that excitement to address the problems. I mean, you know, uh, with Starship is that they didn't expect it to work right on the first flight. And so they're going to come back with a second and a third and eventually it'll get there. And then that will open up all kinds of new doors uh, in and of itself. So yeah, it's, it's a, um, it's not easy to get, operational in space but it's doable and we can do it uh we just need a little more persistence and understanding the problems and, and that sort of stuff and, and it's like far view i mean when we submitted the phrase phase one proposal we were very naive uh and <laughs> after finishing phase one and then working in between phase one and phase two and now what we're planning for phase two this has really made some massive progress and i'm i'm impressed yeah uh you know and it's it's not smoke and mirrors it's real yeah you 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 definitely have the the enthusiastic realism of a phase two winner as opposed to the sort of doubt and uh 
you know, skepticism of phase one winner who is like, I don't know if this is going to work. It's a great idea. We got to do a test. You know, you, you've passed that first level. The, the phase three people are just boundless optimism, right? Mm-hmm. So that's what comes oh, yeah. next is, you know, you just like, you can't find any more problems and that are showstoppers and that gets exciting. Yeah. And I think that's the thing is we're, you know, we're uncovering new ways to do things and, and we have a really good team, really smart group of people, new ideas are popping up. How do we solve this problem? Um, you know, I'm, uh, not a 20 year old, as you can tell. Um, but we have a lot of young engineers, uh, within lunar resources and a lot of young scientists with our science team, um, are spectacular. And it's just really nice and rewarding for me to see, these people coming along and it, it's it's you know yes i'd like to be 25 again doing this stuff uh but it's just the skills they have it just are far in excess of what skills i had at, at that level of my career and it's just really nice to see all this coming out and uh organizations like NIAC really help move this along i mean we're giving vision to things it's not you know the same old you know uh, sum up this this string of numbers and tell me what you get um this is be creative come up with new ideas yeah yeah 100 percent. well uh, ronald what is the best way for people to keep track of the work that you and your team are doing well we will eventually um because right now we're still waiting for our funds to show up uh have, have a web page uh for farview uh, we'll also um, do a, a, a Wikipedia entry and stuff, and so we'll periodically update those. Um, NIAC has a symposium in September of this year, and one next September. Uh, we will present at both those. Uh, we'll be presenting at science meetings. Um, you know, so look for our web pages. Look for uh, presentations at these public meetings. Um, if, you I know, guess wait has- for our reporting. Then we'll we'll right. we'll stay on top yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, right now it's uh, yesterday I went through uh, what did we actually commit to do in the proposal and came up with six pages of commitments, which were about twice as long as what I was expecting. So uh, it's now, you know, yes, there's enthusiasm, but it's also, um, you know, we really said we're going to do this. And so it's <laughs> it's uh, um, mapping it out. Um this is a two year study. So we've got time to get all the stuff together. And so it's, um, getting ready for the kickoff meeting. Um, hopefully we'll start first of June. Um, but, um, and then it's just, you know, issue reports. We are right now working on a paper for, um, uh, publication for the results of the first of phase one, uh, that will hopefully be sent off to the journal next month sometime. Um, and so, yeah, we'll be, uh, putting out things fairly regularly, uh, on this. And like I said, I really want to put up a nice web page and a, and a uh, updatable uh, Wikipedia entry so people can keep track that way. Sounds terrific. All right. Well, Ron, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Say hi to the rest of the team and uh, and good luck with this next phase. And uh, here's oh, hoping you. You, you go to phase three. Yeah, so we. Uh, All right. this is, like I said, this is really exciting. It's really coming together shockingly good. It's really nice to see. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. All right. Take care. Thanks. Bye. You can get even more space news on my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word. There are no ads and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at university.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the University Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at university.com slash podcast or search for University Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Jay Dennis, David Giltonen, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.